Greetings. My name is Kari Bradley. I'm the general manager of Hunger Mountain Cooperative. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our co-op's annual member meeting for 2020. Thank you very much for being here and for this combination of business meeting and community celebration. We're looking forward to sharing this time with you. I'm letting you know that in a couple of minutes, we're gonna kick off with a celebratory toast. So please have your beverage of choice ready to join us. One was included in our snack packs if you were able to get one of those. If you can hear and see me, then you successfully navigated the Zoom login. That's excellent. If you are in need of tech support at any point, please message us through the Zoom chat function. You can find a chat button at the bottom of your screen. Click on that to open a dialog box on the right side where you can type in your message. I'd like you to know that our meeting is being broadcast by Orca Media live on Comcast 1075 or at orcamedia.net if you would prefer to view it there. A recording of this meeting will be posted on their website for later viewing. This is our first annual meeting using teleconferencing technology, and we're learning a lot about how to do this. We acknowledge that compared to our regular in-person meetings, we have limited time and opportunities to interact with each other. Thank you for your patience. We did host two member roundtable discussions in the lead up to this meeting. And we will host another on the evening of November 16th for those who would like more opportunity for questions and discussion. We'll share the details about that later, or you can find them at hungermountain.coop. You can send out a message or question at any time using the chat function. Again, the button is at the bottom of your screen. And you can address your chats either to all of tonight's attendees, or to the panelists only, or just to individuals that you select from the participants list. And a quick, quick word about raffles. Members who pre-registered uh, before November 10th were automatically enrolled in our raffles, and our winners will be announced at the end of the meeting. But you do not have to stick around and then till win. Uh, we will post the results online and contact the winners. And before we move on, I want to offer a shout out to our community relations and information technology teams who worked so diligently on planning this meeting and made it possible for us to be together tonight. And I also want to share that I'm here at the co-op in our community room with Scott Hess. Typically, we would always be wearing facial coverings indoors. Uh, tonight, we will remove our masks when we are presenting so that you will be able to hear us as clearly as possible. We're taking our cue from our governor's press conferences. Please know that we are more than six feet apart and we have the windows open. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our council president, Scott Hess. Thank you so much, Corey, for Scott, we can't hear you. I'm just going to pause you for a second. Okay, let me start all over. Right. Now you're good. Thank you. Okay, I was muted. I apologize. <laughs> Technical difficulty. Thank you so much, Kari. Um, and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And please, your, please raise your glass for a toast. And I would like to toast our co op community. Raise your glass to our employees for their supreme dedication to keeping the store open and us safe. To the members and customers for supporting and shopping at the co-op and abiding by our safety protocols. To the co-op council for their insight and leadership and to the local producers for providing us with healthy products. Thank you all, cheers. And now we wanna hear from you. We're gonna run a couple of quick polls to get a better sense of who is with us tonight. You should see the first poll up on your screen right now. Please respond, but wait a few seconds and as the uh, answers come in. So the first one is how many are, how many people are attending um, this event from, uh, from your login? We're asking this to get a better sense of how many people are actually attending tonight. While we're waiting for the results, Scott, uh, tell us how many annual meetings of the co-op have you attended? I believe this is um, this is probably my eleventh meeting, and I have attended every meeting since I've since we moved up to Vermont. Cool. Yeah. How about you, Kari? 
Um, I think this is number 17 for me. So Wow. <laughs> changed quite a bit over the t that okay. time. Okay. All right. Let's see. It always was a, it was it was always a highlight, and I always really enjoyed receiving the uh, receiving the newsletters while I was not living in Vermont, and just to get a feel, even though not living here. And I think we should just about be getting some results back in. Do we have any results, Ravi? Okay, yes, we do. Okay, it looks like the vast majority, seventy four percent, is only one viewing. Uh, 22% two and three have 2% and a little over for 1%. So great, mainly solo. So thank you so much, that's great. So the next question, um, what, what do you most look forward to um, by not, by the, in the- uh, I think the other one's next actually. I'm sorry, <laughs> I jumped ahead. <laughs> uh, we just added this, this previous question. How long have you been a uh, co-op member, Hunger Mountain co-op member? And if you could just please reply on the screen. Um, how about you, Kari? How long have you been a, a co-op member? Well, uh, see, I grew up in the area, so I've been coming to the co-op since I was a wee lad. Um, I guess back in the 70s, maybe, maybe the early 80s. Mm -hmm. I remember the original co-op location on the corner of Granite and Barry, and then um, when it was further down Barry Street, the second location. Mm -hmm. uh, but I never became a member until I moved back to Vermont in 2004 to take this job. So I guess it's been it's been about 16 years. Oh, okay. How about you? Um, actually, been a member since 07, two full years before we moved up to Vermont. Uh, kept coming up here on vacation and uh, just loving the co-op and actually stacking. Uh, 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 getting supplies and actually bringing them back to to New York, and uh, and then was just thrilled to shop here on a daily basis since '09. So it's been it's it's been a delight being involved and and shopping as I know all of our members do. Okay, Kari, should we see if we have uh, some results that come in? Yeah, Got a wide good. range here. Oh, interesting. The leading vote. Uh, receiver wow. was over 21 years. <laughs> wow, wow. And it's just so interesting being at the annual meetings and meeting so many people that, many, many people that we know of that actually were here at the very, very start that started the co-op. Great. Thank you everybody for participating. And we have another, and we have another question. What most, um, what are you most looking forward to when things get back to normal? And what, what do you most miss about your daily interactions and uh, what's going on in the co-op. So as you can see, which are the following most look forward to post COVID. So if you could just uh, do that. How about you, how about you, Corey? What do you? Uh... Uh, well, I, I mean, uh, pretty much everything on this list is something I miss. I had to pick one. I'll, I'll go with the first one. As someone who is here almost every day and uh, eats a lot of the food, I'm really missing that hot and cold food bar. Um, especially the um, uh, some of the specialty dishes that they put mm. out, um, I miss that for, for sure. Yeah. You, yeah, I I miss all that, but I I really miss the interaction, and I feel like this is kind of a community hall, um, and where I could just it, it's almost impossible to come to this as a co-op and not interact with people and see people that you know from Montpelier, East Montpelier, and and I and I love that interaction. Just either it's a quick hello or or catch up if you haven't seen anybody in a little while. So um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, and hanging out at the cafe, having, you know, meeting somebody, meeting with someone for breakfast or lunch. And that was always a highlight. Sure. Real central place. Well, one day we'll get yes. back there. Hopefully. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's say we have some new results coming in. Okay. Wow, Car, it's pretty split here. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, you've certainly got the, uh, the cold bar and meeting with friends and uh, seeing other people's smiles, relaxed atmosphere. Great, thank you so much. That gives us some insight and, and hopefully seeing for you that are, that are viewing right now to see, uh, see exactly who's, who's, who's signed in so far. And next we're gonna hear, and we're gonna get to hear from some of our, uh, the council members that are currently serving and they prepared a brief recorded statement for you.
Hi, everybody. I'm Eva Schechtman, and I have been serving on the Co-op Council for the past two years. I've been especially busy on the Diversity Committee, the Recruitment Committee, and the Communications Committee. I'm especially appreciative of the staff and management of the Co-op for making a safe place to work and shop. And I look forward to serving the membership for another year. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Jess Knapp. I'm the Community Relations and Marketing Assistant here at Hunger Mountain Co-op. I've been serving as staff representative on the council for two years now. My name is Katie Michaels. Welcome to our first ever virtual annual meeting. I'm the vice president of the Co-op Council and wanted to take this chance to just give a big thank you to the staff of Hunger Mountain Co-op for keeping our community both well nourished and safe during this trying time. Hi, my name is Olivia Denton, and I have served on the Hunger Mountain Co-op Council yeah, for the bottom year way, now. 90 people, 98 um, people. I'm also a staff member of the Co-op. We don't quite have a quorum. But... And um, over the past year, it has just been such a an honor to learn what it means to serve on a board, and how I can better help serve my Co-op and my community. Hi, Pat Sergi from the Council. I hope you had a wonderful day, and I'd like to thank all the hard workers at the Co-op. They've worked through these difficult times, and they've done a great job. So thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Greetings from the sunny November hillsides of Plainfield, Vermont. He says, without the slightest hint of irony in his voice. My name is Stephen Farnham. I serve on the Executive Committee of the Hunger Mountain Food Co-op Council. I've served now two terms, that's six years. I enjoy contributing to the community in this way, and I'm looking forward to serving a third term. Thank you very much for your support. Hi, my name is Eric Jacobson. I'm a member of the Hunger Mountain Co-op Council. I've been a member for three years, and my areas of interest are ethics, diversity, and um, fair trade. And this year I was a principal sponsor of a resolution in support of the organization by the name of Migrant Justice. Thank you so much. And we do have a quorum. A quorum, I didn't mute myself. Great, thank you. We've heard from everyone on the council, except for Andrew Sullivan. Andrew's just completed his first year on the council, and he's also a co-op employee working in the grocery department. Andrew is also a candidate in this year's elections, which leads us to our next topic slide. Annual meeting marks the end of the calendar year, and we're in the process of electing new members. We have four candidates for the four open seats this year. And let's hear from Catherine and Deb, the two non-incumbents running this year. Hi, I'm Catherine Lothar. I joined the co-op in 1989. My background includes growing food organically all my life, being in private practice, doing psychotherapy, health counseling, and massage therapy, teaching at Goddard for the past 23 years, and teaching courses on climate change. I'm a member of Al Gore's Climate Reality Corps, the Vermont Climate Catalyst Program, and the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition. I am very grateful to be part of the co-op community, and I would like to help the co-op continue to localize its food sources, support our farmers, and reduce carbon emissions. I am Deb Robinson, and I love shopping at the co-op. For the food, of course, but also because I know that the money I'm spending is getting recycled into our own economy through the paychecks of our employees, through the payments we make to the food producers we use, and through donations that we make to local organizations that share our values. And none of it, none of it, ends up in the pockets of the super wealthy. For me, being on the council is a way to see that process more clearly, to participate in it, and help and use whatever skills or understandings I have to help us make good decisions going forward. Great, thank you so much. A reminder that our polls are uh, will be closing this evening. Electronic voting is available until 7.30 p.m. tonight. And yes, it is an uncontested election, but voting is still important. 
for determining the final seating assignments. We have three three-year seats and one two-year seat. Back to you, Corey. Now I get to uh, introduce our moderator for the evening, Bonnie Hudspeth. Bonnie is, lives in Putney, and she is in charge of cooperative development for the Neighboring Food Co-op Association. She also serves as the Vice President of the Board of the Cooperative Fund of New England. Welcome, Bonnie, and thank you. Thank you, Kari. Thanks, Scott. And it was really inspiring to hear from other board members describing the, their connection to the co-op. I'm really happy to be here with you all. I love Hunger Mountain Co-op, and I really enjoy stopping when I'm driving from my house in Southern Vermont up to my folks in Burlington. Your cookie selection rocks, your cheeses rock, your local produce we love, and of course, your rock star staff. Can't help but mention them. So I'm really glad to be here with you all. And I wanna remind you that we wanna hear from you. Please type your comments and your questions in the chat at any point. I've already seen some great interaction happening. Someone mentioned buying snowshoes at the co-op. Would love to hear that story. Um, if we run out of time, we'll compile all your remaining questions and make sure to post responses. So you can rest assured, all of your, your questions will be responded to eventually. So with that, let's talk about our plan for the evening. So we are going to approve the 2019 minutes first, recognize some employees at the co-op. We're gonna hear from the diversity committee and we are going to um, learn about the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund Grant Awards. We're also gonna to get to hear from uh, Scott and Kari again, their reports for the year. And then we're going to get to hear a bylaw update. And then we will conclude with a very exciting Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award and raffles, of course. So our first order of business is approval of 2019 minutes. And I gotta just triple check first. Do Rowan, do we have quorum? I believe that we do. Yes, there are um, 99 people that I can see and several have let me know that they are with more than one person. So I believe that counts as quorum. Excellent. Okay, so let's approve the minutes. I hope you've been able to check them out on the co-op's website. Um, can we first have a motion and a second? You can type in the chat so Scott can let me know. Who do we got, Scott? Sorry. I'm sorry. We have Linda Kelly made the motion and it looks like Amy will have seconded it. Thank you, Linda and Amy. Okay, you'll now you should see a poll up where you have the options to vote yes, no, or abstain. So go ahead and click your your choice here. And as we're voting, let's imagine ourselves together, getting to smile, wave at each other, maybe eating a tasty dinner prepared for the co-op. That will happen again, right? All right, let's see how you all voted. All right, we have 83% voting yes, no one voting no and abstaining. So I'm excited to announce the 2019 annual meeting minutes of Hunger Mountain Co-op are thus approved. Thanks everyone. Now we're warmed up, right? We've already practiced our co-op democracy in action. And it's time to now hear from council member Olivia Dunton, who will share employee recognitions. Um, just so you know, she's sharing from inside the busy, vibrant co-op, so you might hear some background noise. Good evening, everyone. I would like to take a moment to say how grateful we are to all of our employees for everything they've done, especially dealing with these unprecedented times and challenges over the last eight months. 
Each year, the club selects one coworker to receive the Hunger Mountain Club Award for Excellent Customer Service in recognition of a person who consistently goes above and beyond in providing service to internal and external customers. This year's winner is Tim Johnson. Tim is a manager on duty, meaning he works with customers, employees, and local vendors responding to various challenges, making decisions in the moment, lending a hand where a hand is needed, and generally providing helpful and friendly service to everyone. The award comes with a gift certificate to one of Tim's favorite local businesses, Birch Grove Bakery. Congratulations, Tim, and our heartfelt appreciation. We would also like to take a moment to recognize our employees who have been with us for many years. Much of our success as a co-op can be attributed to employees who have devoted large parts of their career to us. Here is a list of those who are celebrating major anniversaries this year. Robert Kerrigan, 35 years, produce, produce manager. Mary Wells, 30 years, finance, bookkeeper. Lana Casey, 20 years, finance and receiving, accounts payable clerk and receiver. Elizabeth Jesdale, 20 years, demo coordinator and gatekeeper. Ellie Wood, 20 years, human resources, human resources assistant. Nettie Cadeau, 15 years, front end, cashier. Jeffrey Gilbert, 15 years, grocery, grocery stocker. Leo Ormiston, 15 years, grocery, grocery manager. Jen Palkowski, 15 years, storekeeper, maintenance assistant. Chad Bisaw, 10 years, grocery, grocery buyer. Julie Henderson, 10 years, finance, depositor and payroll assistant. Sonia Keen, 10 years, front end, front end manager. Marcus Lafayette, 10 years, food services, deli packager. Carlin Pru, 10 years, deli, prepared foods, assistant manager. And Amelia Salada Hartman, 10 years, front end, front end supervisor. Please join me in thanking each of these employees for their many years of service to our co op and our community. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, Tim got a lot of love from you all in the comment section. Apparently he's very helpful and remembers people's names. And huge congrats to all employees on these milestones. And, you know, as Olivia was recognizing employees, how your co-op is different came to mind. How, you know, even during these times of crisis, that your co-op is prioritizing retaining jobs, shuffling around to make it happen, caring for staff, and these types of things result in people sticking around for the long haul, as we've just noticed by all these amazing milestones. So that's something to celebrate. Congratulations to all the employees. I'm now going to turn it over to Katie Michaels, Vice President of the Council and Co-Chair of the Diversity Committee. And she will be sharing the Co-op's Diversity Committee report. So take it away, Katie. Hi there, my name is Katie Michaels. I'm a council member and I'm going to be presenting on behalf of the Diversity Committee. The Diversity Committee is composed of both council members and members of the co-op staff. So there are a couple of things we've been up to over the past year, mostly focused on a council level and the co-op has focused on employee training related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. There has been a fair bit of professional development for council members on this topic, ranging from an optional reading group where council members have been able to read articles related to class, race, and gender discrimination, and also all council members last January participated in a workshop related to anti-bias. Um, a couple of other things I want to highlight from this list were this past June, we were all moved by the murder of George Floyd and the national reckoning that we had with issues of race in our country. And the council made a statement on this topic, which we're happy to share with you. And we also made a donation to Black Lives Matter of Greater Burlington 
recognizing our need to put our money where our mouth is and support and stand in solidarity with black members of our Vermont community. And then just this past month, Eva Schechtman on the diversity committee kind of envisioned and worked with CQ Strategies, a local consulting firm, to hold a listening session for members on the topics of racial equity and what the co-op needs to do and how we need to change to be a more inclusive place. On an employee level, most employees have participated in implicit bias trainings, which basically help people recognize their own biases and not act on those instincts. And a number of employees as well as council members participated in a workshop series called We All Belong, which was both individual skill building and also broader thinking about how the co-op can be a place where everyone is welcome and everyone feels like they belong. And one of the outcomes of that We All Belong training was the people who participated developed a statement about the place and space they hope for the co-op to be. The diversity committee and members of the council have worked with that statement and shaped it a little bit to make it a more specific statement about the space that the co-op council hopes that the co-op will be. So I'm gonna read the resolution, which was passed at our last council meeting, where we said Hunger Mountain Co-op wants everyone to feel welcome and we strive to be an inclusive and anti-racist community. We respect differences, honor each person, value your unique stories, and seek to learn from each other. We succeed when you feel that this is your co-op. So this statement is a work in progress. We're continually trying to make it more specific about precisely what we hope for the co-op to be, but we also feel really strongly that it's not enough to make a statement on behalf of diversity. We need to have some action to follow. And so one of the things that I feel really excited about for our 2021 work plan is we're hoping to change the language of the resolution and turn it into an ends policy, which Kari, the general manager and the staff of the co-op would then be responsible for implementing. So as part of that, we as a diversity committee and potentially some additional members of the co-op staff and any members who are interested will be trying to develop metrics that we think should be tracked over time to assess our progress on that topic and also to help the co-op staff develop a work plan to become a more welcoming and inclusive place. Some other things we're thinking about for the year ahead include member workshops, a survey of our members to understand your wishes for the co-op's diversity and equity work, and then some professional development for council members, as well as trainings for staff. So with that, I will pause, but would welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. We have time for a couple of question, comments and questions. And so far I've seen a number of people wanting to be able to clap and raise the roof. So that's what I've seen so far, but, um, we're lucky to have Katie here with us live. So please take your questions for Katie into the chat right now. Katie, I, I, had, a, I had a question or two actually from a member. How, how can you, how can a member, um, you mentioned that members can get involved in, in the uh, diversity issue. Can you expand upon a little bit about how a member can get involved? Yeah, thanks Scott. Um, there's a couple of ways. Um, we would love members to join the diversity committee and help the diversity committee think about what our overall work for the co-op is. Um, but as I said, towards the end of the report, specifically, we're gonna be doing some pretty in-depth work early on in 2021 to work on developing a work plan um, and to refine the resolution we passed into a, an end statement and we need help. And so if you're interested, I'll type my email and Kari's email into the chat and you can email us. We have a meeting next week that you're welcome to join and um, we can go from there, but would really, really appreciate and welcome member participation. That's great, Katie, thank you. Someone made a, uh, Elizabeth made a comment that uh, she hopes that we will continue to embrace economic diversity as well as other racial, gender, and age differences. Do you want to elaborate on that, Katie? 
Yeah, Elizabeth, I think the diversity committee totally agrees. Um, and, you know, last year, a lot of our reading was focused on gender and class diversity, just recognizing that that's a lot of the diversity that we see in the Montpelier community. Um, but I think we want to think about diversity through, on a number of axes and also to think about the intersections between different types of diversity. But absolutely, I think we are hoping to think about all of those pieces. Um, and that's part of why we are hoping to do a survey. Um, we had plans for an in-person survey, which for obvious reasons were curtailed this spring, but really wanting to listen to the community and hear what the specific types of diversity that we need to pay attention to and respond to are. So thanks a lot for that question and comment. Yeah, and I, I see a comment from Rowan that that the co-op has made it easier to participate in the co-op cares needs based discount program. Um, Elizabeth also mentioned as the economy shifts, local food will become more important. Absolutely, Elizabeth. And I think I think your co-op saw that when supply chain was was, you know, compromised that the diversity of relationships you have with local suppliers helped to keep your your shelves stocked. Um, so excellent point. Any other questions or comments for Katie in the diversity committee? All right, anything else you'd like to say, Katie, before we move along? No, I'm just, you know, really grateful for folks excitement about this topic and would love um, folks to join the diversity committee. So I'll share information about doing so in the chat right now. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. All right, now we are going to shift and hear about the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Fund, and I'd like to introduce Matt Levin, who's chair of the Community Fund. Hello, I'm Matt Levin, and I'm honored to be the chair of the Co-op's Community Fund Advisory Committee. The Hunger Mountain Co-op Community Fund was founded in 2005 to offer financial support to organizations, businesses, and initiatives that are aligned with our co-op's mission. Over the past 15 years, we have given out over $58,000 in grants to 52 recipients. These funds have provided critical support to projects that strengthen our community's individuals, local food system, and cooperative commerce. The Community Fund Advisory Committee is made up of member owners, council members, and staff. Our committee makes grant recommendations to the council who has final approval. Our criteria include alignment with the co-op's mission, anticipated project impact, and the applicant's access to other resources. The fund is supported by donations from members and the co-op's operations. Thank you to those of you who have made a donation to the fund. This year, the council elected to donate uncashed patronage refunds to the fund as well. With these funds, the co-op is able to support projects that we know are making a real difference in our community. We were gratified to receive 16 applications this year, and we are very happy to announce that we are able to award $11,030 in grants to seven deserving local organizations and businesses. And now, here are the 2020 Community Fund grantees. Bethany used $790 for a freezer replacement at the food shelf. Greenfield Highland Beef in Plainfield, $2,500 for installing secure freezers for contactless pickup of meat at their farm. Curly Girl Pops of Montpelier, $2,500 to build a mobile commercial kitchen. The Growing Peace Project of Topsom, $1,000 to help them provide food to those in need. The East Callis Community Trust in Callis, $1,000 to help get the East Callis General Store up and running again. And the Twin Valley Senior Center in Plainfield and East Montpelier, $500 to make the services of the Senior Center accessible during COVID. Congratulations to our grantees, and thank you for supporting our Co-op's Community Cooperative Fund. Thank you for that report, Matt. 
and just want to congratulate everyone who came together to collectively raise over $11,000 through your co-op to support these amazing community projects, which feels even more important now. So, Yahoo! I know you guys can't clap. I'll clap. Raise the roof. Um, I'm seeing love for Curly Girl Pops. And I, I see from Denise and Jen from East, uh, the Community Trust, that they're very grateful for the, the grant as they continue to achieve their goal to reopen the general store and to serve their community and beyond. Um, and congrats. Let's see who else. Thanks for helping serve. They do great work in Northfield. Yay for the grants. Ooh, someone figured out how to clap in the comments. So we're seeing lots of love and excitement and truly what wonderful projects that you all help to support through the cooperative. You can raise your hands. Steven says, raise your hands. People are clapping and raising their hands. So a lot of, a lot of things to celebrate. All right. Well, I'm going to turn it back over to Kari now for reporting. Thank you for everyone's attention and participation. Kari, you're muted, so. Thank you, Bonnie, mm -hmm. on many levels. Uh, so Scott and I are now going to provide a brief overview of the past year. Uh, for a more detailed summary, we invite you to take a look at the recorded video presentation of our annual report that is posted on the co-op's website. And or you can join us Monday for the member roundtable discussion. I'm going to start uh, by sharing some of the successes of this past year as I see it. It's just been a remarkable time to operate a cooperative grocery store. First off, in the face of COVID-19, we've been able to maintain, for the most part, a steady supply of food and essential products, despite some shortages, especially of national brands in the spring and summer. This is thanks to our team of dedicated buyers and stockers, and it's also a testament to the robust local food system that we've built up here in Vermont over the past few decades. At the same time, we've maintained employment. Many of our employees change duties and schedules, some chose to stop working temporarily for pandemic related reasons. Some have been able to work remotely. We've had a few retirements uh, and no shortage of staffing challenges this year, but so far we've had no layoffs and no forced reductions in hours. And I believe we are fortunate compared to many businesses these days. One response as a staff to the pandemic has been to increase communication and share in decision-making. For example, we formed a response team of senior managers and union officers, which meets regularly, along with maintaining daily staffing meetings and daily written updates to keep folks informed and provide a forum of exchange of ideas. I would like to pause here and again recognize the incredible efforts of our staff. Likely for most of us, this has been the most daunting challenge of our careers, and I'm extremely proud of our work, and I feel privileged to work with such a dedicated and talented team. One of our accomplishments, we launched our curbside pickup program back in April. It was a significant undertaking executed on a very short timeline. I can share a couple of the markers of success. We now have over 5,000 items available, and recently we have been approaching our goal of 5% of store sales from curbside, and there's capacity to provide even more. This along with other new and altered programs, it's been quite a year and I want to commend every co-op employee along with our members and our local vendors for your dedication and support. Some of the challenges we've been have been and are dealing with the uncertainty operating with incomplete information, changing conditions, new regulations and expectations, lots of logistical challenges. It all keeps us on our toes and adapting knowing at any time a surge in local cases could impact us personally and business-wise through a variety of impacts on supply, demand, or staffing. At the same time, we are always doing our best to consider the interests of shoppers, staff, and vendors, and it can be a delicate balance to meet all needs. I appreciate everyone's patience and flexibility. It's important to recognize that everyone has been dealing with heightened stress and for many months now. We are very concerned about staff burnout. I urge all of us to uh, approach each other with kindness. With so much going on, we just don't know what each other is experiencing at any one moment. 
And one of the sources of stress as a staff has been preparing for the upcoming holidays when we are always we always do see a significant increase in customer traffic. We've been planning since the summer and we are prepared, but still this is our first holiday season during a pandemic. Scott will share some of the details about this in a moment, but now let's shift to a brief financial report. We're going to discuss how we performed in fiscal year 2020, which ended June 30th. Like many grocery stores, we saw an increase in sales, specifically 2.6% more than the prior year, driven by a historic level of sales in March. At the same time, operating expenses were only up 0.6% as we saw reduced staffing and we pulled back on discretionary spending. These totals do inc include increased pay and benefits that we agreed, agreed to with our employees union in recognition of the increased risk and stress. Net income before taxes and patronage refund came to $569,312, our best year in over a decade. You'll see there's an asterisk here due to the fact that our audited financial statements are not yet complete. The reason for that being that in order to determine this year's patronage refund, we're waiting on action by Congress to determine whether the forgivable portion of the Paycheck Protection Act loan that we received last summer is subject to income tax or not. Regardless of how that resolves, we did a good job of controlling expenses and ended the year with more than $2.7 million in cash. So we were relatively well positioned if we should experience a downturn in sales or other financial hardships. Now I'll turn it over to Scott. Thank you so much, Kari. As you can see in this pie uh, chart slide, um, we'll first take a look at the the big blue area, 63% of that's our sales. And that went back to our suppliers for the cost of the goods sold. And that's a little lower than, than uh, on, under normal circumstances. The 28% were the employee compensation. That was in the form of wages, benefits, and this was basically right on budget. The other smaller sliver, the other expenses, that was 6%. And that was cut down considerably and staff did a great job cutting down on those costs. And that other small sliver of, um, of the, light, the light blue was our net income, as Kari just mentioned, the 2.2%, which, um, which is really good in the grocery industry. And parts of this amount will be used to pay out income taxes and a patronage refund once Congress acts, as Kari just mentioned. <clears throat> I'd like to go through uh, a few words on safe shopping for this holiday season in terms of what the co-op is doing. The co-op has expanded our curbside uh, pickup, as has been mentioned, and I see a lot of comments on how successful it is and how happy you are about it, with pickups between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. every day. We've also expanded the hours back to normal, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to accommodate this extra shopping in this busy season. And we'll continue, though, please, please remember, we're going to continue to limit the number of customers inside of the store to provide adequate space and the 9 to 10 a.m. time frame is still reserved for high-risk shoppers. Staff has reduced the number of freestanding displays on the sales floor to reduce uh, crowding. And of course, hand sanitizer and masks are available for shoppers, and we will continue to sanitize the frequently touched surfaces. And what we can do as shoppers to remain safe. As you all know, the most important steps are what our healthcare experts emphasize. Wear a facial covering, maintain six foot distancing to the extent possible and wash hands often. Additionally, we ask that you give our curbside program a try. It's the single best way to reduce our own risk and save space in the co-op for others. We encourage folks to shop intentionally. Please, if, if possible, use a list stock up now for things you will need during the holidays and shop at the show, shop at slower times early in the day or late in the day on Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays are the slowest times shop alone. If you can, all this is, and more is summarized in our guide to safe shopping for the holidays, which is posted on the co-op website. So thank you so much for your support and together we are keeping our community and ourselves safe. Sorry, back to you. 
So finally, I want to speak to an initiative to help address hunger here in central Vermont. The University of Vermont is reporting that nearly one in four Vermonters experienced food insecurity this past summer, and that children and people of color are amongst the most susceptible groups. The Vermont Food Bank has nearly doubled its distribution this year, and it's not enough. On top of all the other challenges right now, too many of our neighbors are dealing with life without enough food. So from now through the end of December, the co-op is organizing our Neighbors Helping Neighbors Food and Fund Drive, with all donations going to the Vermont Food Bank and our Central Vermont Food Pantries. You can help by donating at the cash register. We've secured matching donations from our community partners, Northfield Savings Bank, Cabot Creamery, and Feral Distributing. Food donations are being collected at the co-op every day, and we are running buy one, give one promotions focusing on different staple items right through the end of 2020. Our goals are to raise $15,000 and 2,000 pounds of food. It's an ambitious goal, and I urge all of us to participate in this important community effort. And we'll pause there and turn it back to Bonnie. Thanks, Kari. So I'm noticing a lot of member owner excitement and gratitude about curbside, and I noticed a couple of members saying that they could not shop if not for curbside. And uh, Bill said that he's thinking of the co-op as his refuge in an increasingly strange world. That's a really good representation of, of what the co-op means, right? And I just wanted to take a moment to recognize the co-op staff and incredible board and leadership during this stressful and scary time because the fact that they came together, they worked to innovate and launch new programs and somehow pull off the best sales in a decade under these stressful conditions while taking countless measures to keep staff safe, member owners safe, and the community fed and connected and safe is just amazing. So thank you. I have to say that. I can't not say that. So, um, and now we want to hear from you. It's time for your questions. I've seen a couple questions already typed in the chat, so I'll, I'll queue those up first, um, but keep typing them in if you got more. So, um, this first question I'm going to throw to Kari. Kari, we've got a question about out of stocks when shopping online, and how can people suggest products to be added to curbside? Well, certainly send us your suggestions. We, we want to hear what, you, what to prioritize. Um, so please email us at info at hungermountain.coop. You can also uh, call us on the phone, 223-8000. Um, uh, we're adding, we have been adding products as quickly as we can. I mentioned we're up to over 5,000, but obviously there's uh, still um, other products to be added. And uh, if you help us prioritize, um, We'll, we'll do that. Out of stocks are a challenge, uh, certainly, and we're doing our best to stay on top of that. I think one of the benefits of going to um, pick up throughout the day is it has reduced that to some extent. Um, and here's an area where you see an interaction with the fact that we are so focused on local um, that, um, you know, we work with a lot of smaller businesses. Um, so, uh, you know, we're not necessarily designed to be in stock with all products all times. So bear with us on that. It is something that we're trying to do better with and because uh, we don't want to disappoint you. And we know it's, it's important. Great. Thanks, Kari. Um, I, I see a question here. What's the plan for the winter? Sure. So uh, we called um, our, the gate, gatekeeping program is what we call the uh, program where we limit the number of shoppers that are in the store at any one time. And that's in order to provide uh, um, proper spacing within the co-op. And with the colder weather coming, we know we're gonna have to make some adjustments to the, both the layout and the procedures. So you may have seen that we've constructed a room within the entryway and um, that's for our employees so that they are provided some warmth and some um, proper distancing. And then we're going to be um, asking our customers um, when a line must form, it'll be outside, it'll work, be under cover at least partially, and we're going to be um, providing even more enclosure to provide some um, protection from the elements. But uh, we recognize that it's going to be um, challenging, and, um, and so please, on those particularly cold and snowy days, uh, just know that we're trying to get you inside as quickly as possible. Um, think about shopping. Um, and avoiding the, the most most popular times, which tend to be the lunch times 
Wednesdays, Fridays, Saturdays. Right now, they tend to be the busiest. Uh, and also, please consider the curbside pickup program because that's your best way um, um, to, to shop without even leaving your car. Great. Thanks, Kari. Um, Pat is giving applause to, for co-op efforts and for supporting local food need issues, financial and food donations. And there's lo Bernadette is cheering for the response and problem solving of the co-op has been most remarkable. Kudos to the amazing staff and gratitude for showing up and doing a great job. Um, we do have another question about how would it affect the co-op if the PPP loan is taxable? Yeah, it, it will just mean that the forgivable portion, which is going to be the majority of it, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering the exact number, but it's a significant amount um, that will be subject to income tax, you know, um, roughly 21%. So it's a, it's a difference of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, that, and that will affect our bottom line and our, our cash position. Um, at the last council meeting, um, based on our accountant's uh, recommendation, the council actually approved uh, patronage refund for both scenarios, whether it's uh, taxable or not, so that when Congress does act and we do have the guidance, we'll be able to move forward as quickly as possible. Um, so. In either case, I think that co-op's in, in um, pretty good financial position right now. We're fortunate, um, especially compared to a lot of local businesses. Um, but we've, you know, we've been conservative. We've, we've built up our, um, our um, reserves for a reason. And that's um, just recognizing that uh, it could be tough times ahead. Yeah, sounds like proactive planning. Um, so there's a question about how do you staff the curbside program and um, how does it actually work? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, right now the staffing is primarily provided by our front end department, which is our cashiers. And uh, they've, they've really been doing a great job. Um, uh, so the way it works is that, um, you know, we're using obviously an online platform. Uh, it's connected to our point of sale um, software, that, that technology, so that really integrates nicely um, with our inventory database and um, we are able to, um, you know, basically see your orders, um, it generates a pick list so that our uh, employee can basically do the shopping for you, process the transaction, um, you know, using using payment card, we're, we're taking, taking payment and then um, that goes into storage until uh, you arrive. And then when, the, when you, the customer, pull up to the front of the store, you give us a call uh, on our mobile phone. We answer, go get your order, bring it out, and load it up for you. It's, uh, there's a number of steps. Um, seems to be working uh, reasonably well, I, I should say. Hats off to the team, because it's, it's a lot of work, as you can imagine. Um, we're doing between 20 and 40 something orders a day, and those range from I don't know, um, maybe 40 or 50 dollars up to six, seven hundred dollars. Um, so it's it's a lot, and um, it, you know to juggle all that while maintaining normal operations, uh, you know, many many appreciations to the team. Absolutely, lots of shuffling and juggling. And, that, and, that, and that's one of the most frequent comments that and, and thank yous that I've gotten from members and friends that they're just so ecstatic as we're seeing in the, in the chats. It's just been a, a remarkable job. And, and the council can't thank the staff um, enough for their heroic and, you know, the, for the tremendous effort um, in this. It's, it was we used to we get updates on a regular basis and we're just so appreciative. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And um they all, they're just, just posted the curbside link in the chat. So if anyone wants to click on it and explore it, it's right there for you to check out. Um, and so we have a question from Billy about as we're adapting to climate change and try to decrease our own impacts, can we look, begin to look at our buying policy and transportation issues around shipping from afar that impact the climate? Slowly decreasing national brands in favor of local, increasing local available options. Yep, I, I think that's a good point. Um, certainly this co-op, um, like many co-ops, but especially I would say this co-op because um, we're so blessed with 
having such a strong local food system, local food is really a priority here. And uh, this year's report, you know, again, in that um, recorded annual report, you'll, you'll hear about this a little more, but about 38% of our sales last year came from local products. Uh, and we've been hovering around that 40% mark for a while. And I think that, you know, there's a balance. We can, we are always striving to do more, but we're also recognizing there are some benefits to some of the national brands too, especially when it comes to, to price. And uh, that's an important consideration for folks these days, especially. So um, always looking to fill the gaps where there are product uh, categories that aren't, aren't represented by local. Um, that's an opportunity um, to, to bring in another local product and local vendor and maybe an, uh, a, a startup business can uh, form to, to fill that gap. Um, but increasingly, those are, those are harder to find because our system is pretty well developed and um, people are really taking advantage of those opportunities in the market. So, um, yep, I'm, and we're so open to other ideas around this topic. And, and, you know, you tell us what is the proper balance between local and all the other values that, that we hold dear as a co-op. Great question, Kari. And Elizabeth is already answering it. <laughs> your, your member owners have some ideas. So Elizabeth suggests that perhaps a group of co-op members can start to suggest how to shop local, prepare meals using local or low energy impact foods, and then post recipes in the newsletter um, and feature ingredients also in co-op deals, thinking about affordability and accessibility. Great idea, Elizabeth. Um, I'm sure I'm sure the co-op knows how to find you. So, um, and it looks like we're we're going to wrap up the Q and A section now. But as I mentioned before, we really want to make sure that all of your questions are addressed, and so um, staff will be making sure to collect them and follow up with you. And also, you're welcome to join us Monday 16th at that's you know this coming Monday at 6 p.m. for further discussion. Um, your Kari will share more information about this with you at the end of the meeting. And at any point, you can also submit additional questions and comments to annual meeting at hungermountain.coop. We'll, we'll post that, that email so you can just click it right from the chat. Um, so you'll, you'll see responses in upcoming e-news um, to your, some of your questions. And um, yep, the e Jess just posted the email right in the chat. So thanks, everyone. And thank you to um, Scott and Kari for handling all the questions. All right. I am now going to introduce Carl Etnier, who's chair of the bylaw committee. Hey folks, the person introducing this segment probably will have already told you this, but I'm Carl Etnier, I am chair of the bylaws committee. And I thank you for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the process that we've been working on for amending the bylaws and related co-op housekeeping. The committee had hoped to bring proposed amendments to you at a special meeting earlier this year, this past spring. Unfortunately, for reasons we know all too well, meetings of every kind were canceled this spring and we don't know when we'll be getting back together for in-person meetings. Meanwhile, the problems remain that got us together. Our current bylaws, they're still poorly organized. They're still full of typos and difficult to understand sentences. Every time we went to look up something in the bylaws, we were just struck by how dreadfully they're written. So I'm here to tell you what our thoughts are about moving forward on these proposals. First, a little background, what's happened so far. A committee of co-op members, including two council members, has worked on a massive overhaul of the co-op's bylaws since early 2019. We built on proposed bylaw amendments crafted since 2014, and we dug in a lot deeper than that previous work. Many of you have been involved in the discussions with our committee. We've circulated drafts of our work to members. We've held public meetings to discuss those drafts. Some of you have also visited the regular committee meetings. They've been open to the public, or you've read our minutes, which are posted at the co-op's website. Through all this work over more than a year and a half, we created bylaws that the co-op can be proud of and we think it'll make it easier to govern the co-op. We really look forward to presenting them to members for a vote. So what we want to do going forward and based on what happens at this meeting, 
we'll find out how well we as a co-op can have reasonable discussions with online technology. We're hoping to bring the bylaws to you for approval in late approval in late winter or spring of next year, 2021. We'll be doing that in an online forum. After this annual meeting, the committee will get back together and assess how feasible this really seems. If we do decide, okay, we wanna go ahead with this, we'll tell the council that, and if they're okay with it too, we'll have a significant information campaign starting in January to make sure that when the time comes, you're prepared to make informed decisions. Well, that's it very briefly from the bylaws committee. I'd like to thank the committee members for all their hard work month after month to put together these improved bylaws. They include Jed Davis, Stephanie Kaplan, and Sue Zekas, council members Stephen Farnham and Scott Hess, and Kari Bradley has been with us at almost every meeting. Cheryl Connor was an invaluable member during the committee's first year of its work before she moved out of state. I look forward to hearing more from you about the bylaws and the process in the Q&A period and All in right. the months ahead. Well, thank you, Carl. And what questions? Anyone have questions? I see a, an appreciation and thanks to everyone who worked so hard on this from Olivia. Any other questions again? Um, I do see a question about how, oh, and bylaws are tough. Acknowledgement from Amy that bylaws are tough. Thanks for doing it. <laughs> um, there's a question about how can I learn more about what's going on with the bylaws? Sure, I can take it. Can you hear me? Yes. Sure. So uh, the committee is going to uh, get together and um, make a decision about going forward. And if it looks like we are going to present them to you this spring, as we hope to, or uh, or late winter, then uh, there'll be all sorts of opportunities to find out about them. Uh, if you want, you can go to the Hunger Mountain Co-op website right now and find the bylaws. It's the same page as the um, the council meetings, I believe. Uh, but if you just do a search for the, the bylaws, you'll get to it. And uh, the proposed um, changes, the proposed amendments are, are there along with uh, the existing bylaws and the articles of incorporation. And uh, you can ask any of us on the committee as well. Carl and Carl, I think the uh, the minutes are also listed on the website if people want to go back and and read those also. If you want to read through minutes of dozens of meetings, <laughs> they're there too. Sounds like you can learn maybe more than you want to know about <laughs> what the board's been up to. Thanks, Carl. Any other questions? Uh, Carl, you're getting a shout out from Stephen Barnum about getting a lot of credit. And if you if you were paid for your efforts and hard work, it would cost the co-op a small fortune. So thank you for volunteering. And it's just an, another example of how how you, how you as a member owner are helping to shape your co-op. Thank you. Carl has done an Carl's done an amazing job, thorough and a tremendous amount of work. So I, I echo Stephen's comments on behalf of the council and the committee. Tremendous job. Really is a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you. If there aren't any further questions, I could say just a little bit something more about the committee's process. Sure, go for it. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that three of the now six members on the committee, uh, since one of them moved out of state, three of us have a history of opposing bylaw amendments from the council, and I, I was one of them. We weren't motivated by knee-jerk opposition. We just thought that these previous proposed amendments were not improvements. And we rolled up our sleeves and worked with so many others to develop these bylaw uh, proposals that are clearer. And we hope uh, they will open the door for more participation by members. And that we are open to hearing all sorts of opinions on the bylaw proposals. I want to let you know that in this process, we've heard lots of disagreements and we've had our internal disagreements, uh, some of them uh, quite sharp disagreements at time. But we've generally succeeded at keeping the level of discussion polite and respectful, and we're going to try to keep it that way going forward, too. So we hope many of you will continue to be part of that process. Thank you for sharing that, Carl. It's not, we know democracy is messy and also precious, right? So <laughs> thank you for laying out the co-op's intentional process for bylaw revisions. And it sounds like you are welcoming feedback and participation. And you're still standing and smiling and energized <laughs> after the process. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 
All right. I don't see any more questions, but you know how to get in touch, right? You can you can um, contact the co-op, and there's a number of ways to get involved. All right. Well, now we are going to hear from Council Member Dr. Eric Jacobson for the Hunger Mountain Cooperative Community Award. Hi, my name is Eric Jacobson. Helen and Jules Rabin, uh, the winners of the 2020 Hunger Mountain Community Award, single-handedly changed the character and the flavor of bread making and bread in Vermont. When they began baking bread in their self-built wood-fired oven in 1977 in a shed behind their home, Bread in Vermont was mostly of the manufactured variety produced with low cost ingredients in industrial facilities located far and wide, none of it with sourdough or whole grains. A crust of sourdough would have only been obtainable at the fanciest of European style bakeries in the big cities if not for Helen and Jules Rabin of Upland Bakers of Marshfield. It all began during a visit that Jules and Helen made to Le Arche, a commune in southern France in 1971. Like in many villages and small communities across rural Europe, a stone-baked oven formed the center of communal life and the locus of mutual aid. There simply wasn't such a place to bake bread in Vermont. Returning home, Jules and Helen began work on the oven. They lugged flat field stones from the banks of the Onion River, burning out the engine of their Volkswagen bus just hauling stones to the oven site. They thought that they would bake their own bread and invite their neighbors to do the same, a communal oven that would bring uh, neighbors together. As one writer noted, the oven would be part of Jules and Helen's vague and larger communitarian dream. According to Jules, the population of Marshfield was just too sparse to make practical use of a community oven. His vision of community. And the 1970s French experience marked by the phrase, be realistic, demand the impossible, Helen and Jules surely would not have been ready to make a go of, of baking for the community when Jules was laid off from his teaching position at Goddard College in 1977. The Upland Bakers were born and they grew to produce, by one report, up to 600 loaves at their oven, distributing bread throughout the local region to great appreciation and ultimately great demand. Staying small was one of their goals. The Ravens retained uh, retail their bread only at a handful of nearby stores, food co-ops, and a few restaurants. As Jules once noted back in, 19, in the 1990s, down familiar roads 5, 10, 20 miles away live the various people who eat our bread. 200 times a day or so our bread shows up at different tables. The bread has made the life of this jumble of hills and valleys a thread more convivial. Today, things are a bit different. Today, there are dozens of sourdough whole grain bakeries across Vermont, making Vermont particularly known for its high quality and locally produced breads. This is all thanks to the dedication of Helen and Jules Raven, the Upland bakers whose perseverance in serving the community for more than 40 years, not only kept us fed and in good health, they single-handedly transformed the food culture of, of Vermont one loaf at a time. I cannot think of a more worthy recipients of the first Hunger Mountain Community Award than Helen and Jules Raven for their outstanding contribution to, to the sustenance of our local economy. Congratulations, Helen and Jules. Thank you, Eric. Is anyone else craving a warm piece of sourdough right now? 
<laughs> I can eat a loaf of bread. So you can see Helen and Jules standing next to their beautiful oven and joining a well-deserving group of co-op community award recipients. Big congratulations. Um, so now we get to hear from Nessa Raven, daughter of Helen and Jules, and also a longtime co-op employee. Employee, And Nessa's going to read us a statement prepared by her parents. I want to thank you very much, really. I'm sure I don't know why Helen and I were selected for this honor, except that we are a long-lived pair, and being of the great migration of the 1960s, we have lived here for more than 50 years and have acquired a little moss on ourselves. First, that was in a cottage we rented from Walter Smith, the foremost farmer of the area, and a very special Vermonter and then in a house we built for ourselves with the very prominent help of a couple of new carpenters, recent migrants to Vermont like ourselves. No, that's backwards. It was the carpenters who built the house with ourselves assisting and taking greater charge as we learned the skills. In the course of time and because of changes in our lives, the shrinking down of Goddard College where I had been hired to teach anthropology, we became the Upland Bakers. We fell in with a new mystique of bread, good bread, preferably sourdough bread and baked in a wood-fired oven. We had encountered that combination in France, the bread and the oven, and it had held an attractive place in our minds. We built that ultimate oven ourselves with no previous masonry experience. Helen studied a few books to guide us and masonry novices though we were, we did it built ourselves a serviceable oven over a long summer with field stone gathered from the stone dumps. Why sure, help yourselves at the back of ends of Walter Smith's fields. We didn't maraud any stone walls in all that effort. The stone and brick oven we made with Helen, our mason in chief, was sort of preposterous, but it worked surprisingly well and served us for the 20 years that we baked bread for the area supplying a small scatter of stores and food co-ops. We were, I believe, early factors in the bread revolution, which is now well established in this part of Vermont and elsewhere. Then we began to get old, quit that career, and left the hard work of baking to now numerous other people. Now this is us, me, as a current member of Hunger Mountain, we live fairly isolated on a dirt road 10 miles from Montpelier. Fixed in place as people our age tend to be, it's for me an event to come to town, which I do about once a week. The co-op is one of our regular stops when we go to town and moseying around in it for our purchases and once in a while for lunch with a friend. I feel a little as though I had arrived at something appearing around the bend as I make my way through the oddly arranged aisles of the store. Nod, 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 chat, chat, chat. A pleasure of a special kind, that is for back road people like us. And one of the pleasures is the sight of the little kids in carriages whose mothers and fathers, besides shopping, are looking too for a little of the village green experience, for a casual encounter with a friend or acquaintance, or for me, just a sight of a Gaga one-year-old looking from their carriage at the wonderful array of goods and faces they come across, the faces remarkably. So I'll end with that, that little prize and surprise of the baby wondering about the faces he sees at the co-op, that frank curiosity, and the hankering eye of the old guy, me, who has yet to greet his first great-grandchild. Thank you. And once again, that was Nessa, daughter to the beautiful award recipients. Um, that was very touching. And what a beautiful description of their story and how they called the fourth the co-op as their village green. Um, I imagine a lot of us can relate to that feeling. And this award comes with a beautiful apple crafted by Matt Seascholtz. Uh, Kari's holding it up now, so that will be given to the award recipients. 
and uh, along with a $200 gift card to the co-op for the next time they come to shop. Um, I see Elizabeth shared amazing bread makers, one of the local, uh, one of the original local bread makers, well deserved. And Paul shared with all the wonderful bread makers we have today, I still long for a loaf of Jules and Helen's rye bread. I remembered the days in the old co-op, the second Berry Street store. Jules came on Tuesdays and Fridays, and we weren't allowed to purchase more than two loaves. Thank you, Helen and Jules. Uh, Jennifer shared that she's needing a hanky right now. Such a mo moving award. And um, yeah, Olivia noted, what a truly beautiful piece of writing and incredibly read uh, with a thanks to Helen, Jules, and Nessa. And um, Eric Jacobson noted, what a delightful reception speech. Thank you to Helen and Jules for all the years of wonderful service to the community. And Nora, everyone's chiming in. Thank you, Helen and Jules, for everything and your continuing inspiring words read so beautifully by Nessa. It does seem like a good time. You know, it's the evening. We could gather on the fire and I could listen to Jules. <laughs> Jules' words all night. Maybe we could have, or Kari, you could organize some, some winter readings to keep us comforted and connected. Fireside chat. Fireside chat. So it sounds great. So congratulations, Helen and Jules, and for your many contributions to the co-op community. And um, it looks like people are excited about winter readings with Jules. <laughs> and I just want to say three cheers for all of you, the member owners who are the heart of your co-op, right? So thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kari one last time to bring us to the wrap up and closing our evening together. Thank you all. Great. Thanks, Bonnie. So now we're going to move into our closing sec section. And I want to start by recognizing our outgoing council members. Pat Searge, who has served for the past three years, including on our recruitment committee as secretary and as treasurer this past year. Also, Jess Knapp, who has been the staff representative to council for the past two years, bringing employee perspectives to the council conversation. We have gifts for both of you, and many thanks for your service. We also want to thank Julia Goldstein, who served on the council last year until the summer when she needed to resign. Thank you, Julia. And I want to recognize Katie Michaels and Scott Hess, who will be stepping down at the end of December, our president and vice president this past year, both served on multiple committees and have done so much for the co-op. Our sincere appreciation. And a personal thank you to Scott, who has served on the council for the past 10 years. Through many ups and downs, Scott has always reliably stepped up to help with whatever was needed. Many, many thanks to every, for everything, my friend. In anticipation of the vacancies created by Scott and Katie's departure, the council is planning to appoint two members to serve until next year's election. An appointment application is available at our website and will be due December 3rd. The council will interview applicants and make selections in early December. I hope you will consider applying and let us know if you have any questions. Remember, we have a member roundtable discussion this Monday at 6 p.m. This will be an opportunity to further discuss the topics we covered tonight or any others. And you can join us using the GoToMeeting platform. There's a login link on our website. You can also email us at annualmeeting at hungermountain.coop. Again, we will respond to your questions and we'll compile all the questions and comments in an upcoming edition of the Member e Newsletter. And a reminder that Monday is our deadline to order turkeys and pies for Thanksgiving. Uh, turkey uh, online ordering is easy. The, the pickup will be available the four days prior to Thanksgiving in the parking lot next door to the co-op. We're going to keep it outside this year. And please consider also placing a curbside pickup order for Thanksgiving. This will be a separate order from your turkey, but you can combine the actual pickup for the safest and most convenient way to shop. You'll be able to get all or, or most of what you need without even leaving your car. Finally, a heads up that will be closed on Thanksgiving and the day following. So that's the 26th and the 27th in order to give our staff a well-deserved break. Thank you very much for your support. Wishing you and your loved ones a safe and joyful holiday season. Back to you, Scott. Thank you so much, Kari. Thank you for those kind words. We have many people to thank. Um, Matt Schultz, 
created the award and the rape that the Ravens received and the pizzazz pottery crafted um, for Pat, uh, the beautiful ceramic plate for her council service. On your screen, you'll see a list of the vendors who donated raffle prizes and the treats in our snack packs. Also thanks to Liv Dunton and Muffin Spencer for coordinating the food donations. Also thank you to Orca Media for broadcasting and recording tonight's meetings, the night's meeting. Thank you again to Northfield Savings Bank, Cabot Creamery and Farrell Distributing for generous donations to our neighbors helping neighbors food and fun drive. Many thanks to Bonnie for moderating and thank you to our other presenters, Liv, Katie, Matt, Carl, Eric, and Nessa. We also need to thank the employees who put so many hours and planning and preparing for this event. Stephanie Canonan, Rowan, Sher Rowan Sherwood, uh, Jess Knapp, Ravi Nielsen, Giles Brule, thank you for helping us have a successful remote annual meeting. And now on to our raffles. This is the slide. Um, the first group of winners, congratulations, will contact you about how you can pick up your prize. And for the grand prize, the grand prize is the two. We have Sue Zekas. She wins the camping essentials box. And Lisa Rochelle wins the $100 co-op gift card. Congratulations to all of our winners. And please give us your feedback on how this meeting went. A survey will appear immediately after the meeting to get your reaction. We'll also email you a survey as a follow-up if you prefer to fill it out later. Thank you for participating. Have a safe holiday season and take care all. Thank you so much. And let's adjourn by consensus at 723. Thank you all.